Good morning. Good morning. You hear it now? It's there it comes. All right. I don't want anybody to. I know uh, they might say I've heard better teaching, but I've not ever heard teaching better. <laughs> so don't turn it up too loud. Good to see everybody here this morning. I'll tell you, folks, we have been having some lessons. And, but you know what? I've, I have been finding out they are lessons that have been needed in this day and time. The title of our lesson this morning is God the Creator. God the Creator. And you know what? Man and people today in society seem to spend so much time trying to disprove the existence of God. And they'll totally, you know, they, they tout science all the time. But they'll totally leave science when it comes to trying to prove that there is no creator. So, folks, let's do as we normally do. Each and every one of us pray in our own way. Let's go to the Lord this morning and ask him to send his spirit to lead us into truth this morning. Let's go to him. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you, the great creator, this morning. God, for everything that we have, we know that all good things come from you. Lord, we just ask that you would just send your spirit to lead us into truth this morning. God, that we would be able to hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen and amen. Our study this morning on God the Creator, our central truth says God created an orderly world and made humans in his image. In his image. Our key verse this morning is Genesis 1 and 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Our learning objectives. It's always good to be thinking about what we're studying and what we're trying to learn this morning. Our learning objectives says, Students will know and understand that the universe is the creation of God who reveals his power and his glory in it. Also, we'll be, uh, to be able to develop a growing sense of awe and reverence for the God who created us, that we may better know Him as Creator and Redeemer. And also, to live as creatures of God in, in dependence on a relationship with Him. Do you depend on your relationship with God? I do. I'll tell you for sure. This lesson begins a unit of study that examines the topic of creation as it's woven through the scriptures today. We're discussing the agent of creation, God. In our world, many believe creation to be a phenomenon that came about by some cosmic accident. As believers, it's important that our faith be firmly grounded in the conviction that God is our creator. Uh... And as far as that phenomenon that came about by some cosmic accident, uh, I read, and I'm sorry I can't remember his name, and I do have to keep notes. I wish I was more like Brother Teal. I tell you what, he's got a memory on him. But, I, and I can't remember the man's name, but a French mathematician, he was trying to work out the chances of a molecule forming on its own. And I forget how many hundreds of thousands to the 130th power <laughs> that he said. Anyway, it come up with billions. It would take, but for something like that to happen, the chances are that it would take billions of years for a molecule to form just by chance. And the thing about it is, once you get that one molecule formed, one molecule won't do you any good. There's an infinitesimal number of molecules that make up the tiniest of things I mean so I'm gonna be real honest with you I I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stick with God said Amen. God said and when he said is when it came into existence wasn't it a reality God is creator a, a reality that in turn establish and are accountable to him and can live in relationship with him then as we grow in faith and we turn each other's well I'm, excuse me we teach our children the basis of that faith because folks if we don't teach our children the basis of this faith that we're talking about we're one generation away from totally you know and, and the word of God warns us so many times 
you know, it seems like every time there would be a great awakening and, and, and God's children would be drawn unto him. And the scripture would say, and then there arose another generation who didn't depend on God. One generation away. That's why we have to teach these things. We have to teach them. Uh, our commentary always has an opening activity and it, it has a question. It says, did you ever as a child or an adult for that matter lie out on a blanket on a clear starry night and look up at the stars? What do you remember about the thoughts and the questions that you had when you first experienced the magnitude of creation? Think about the magnitude of creation. Uh, even the people that study our universe today and of course they wouldn't even have time to count them but they can just count one block and then add these things all up and they've come to the conclusion that there's approximately 400 billion stars in our galaxy 400 billion stars in our galaxy and on top of that this Hubble telescope that they have can detect uh, about 80 billion galaxies now I went to school at Howe <laughs> and if I try to start working out a multiplication table about 400 billion times 80 billion I, I you can't even imagine I mean how many zeros is that folks <laughs> how many zeros would that be I mean I, I, I would I couldn't even begin to, to imagine the magnitude of creation Amen. and the magnitude as we observe God's creation common questions that come to mind are where did all those stars come from how far are they away what's beyond what I can see how big is the universe for some it may not have been the night sky that caught your attention perhaps it was seeing the ocean for the first time how many molecules are in that ocean? And if one molecule took billions of years to form by chance, it boggles the mind. Doesn't it? I'll tell you another thing that boggles the mind is how people could believe that it did come about by chance. I see no way. Others may have been deeply moved by viewing a magnificent mountain vista. The psalmist David may well have been looking at a starlit sky when he wrote, When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. And think about it, folks. He set them in place, and we set our clocks today. Even though we have the most sophisticated timepieces, you know, I can remember, I know I've told you this before, but I can remember when uh, you buy the little watches at town and you had to wind them up. Yeah. And it wouldn't be probably about every morning if you had a good clock at the house yeah. you'd have to reset it because it would but it would bend, end up being five or ten minutes off through the course of one day and yet we have the sun and the moon and these things how do they reset those clocks even these even these quartz movement that they've got now and even those I think they have like an atomic clock that is supposed to be so accurate but yet as time goes they have to reset it and what do they reset it by they reset it by the sun they reset it by the sun that most I'm talking about you know the sundial you think that was probably the first instrument that was ever invented to tell time and it's more accurate than the most sophisticated one that we have today think about that a man can go up and drive a stick up right out in the middle of a field and if he cleared out a spot and marked off those increments on it he would have an instrument there that is more I'm talking about it, that is more accurate than the most sophisticated clock that's ever been invented it is it, it, how God created this thing and how he keeps it going but the psalmist David may have well been looking at a starlit sky when he wrote, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers. What are mere mortals that you would think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Psalms 8 
and, and 3 and 4 says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Well, yeah. think about it, folks. Uh, Psalms 144 and 3 says, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? As, as huge as our galaxy and our universe is today, that he would be mindful of one man. A speck of dust. A speck of dust. Hebrews 2 and 6 says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? That he would take time to commune and visit with each and every one of us that has a personal relationship with him. The creator God has always existed. We're going to begin reading in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, we're going to read the first two verses. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I don't know. I am no Bible scholar. I mean, I study the Word of God on my own. And I know that there are people that are a lot more well studied than I am. And they have theories and things that to explain certain things. But I just take it literally. Amen. I take it literally, and I do. And I'm not saying that any of those theories are, are right or wrong, but uh, you know, some of these things, like the gap theory, I've looked in mine, and folks, I don't see no gap between verse one and verse two. <laughs> now I know I'm being a little bit funny here, but because some people believe in the gap theory, what they call the gap theory, and you know, they may very well be true. Because I'm going to tell you something, God and His the way he set things in order and the way he's done things are very complex and hard for us to... That's why I know I, I, I said it a while ago. I rely on and God said. Yeah. Amen. And God said. So that is the most important. If we look around us at the beauty and the complexity of nature, at the miracle of birth, the obvious conclusion is that there is a God who created it all. Those who claim to believe in a natural, godless origin of the universe are hard-pressed to explain how such complex systems would come into being without an intelligent creator. The belief that one true God exists and that he, is a, that he alone is the center of the universe is at the very foundation of a Christian worldview. This belief is ultimately what separates Christians from other religions as well as from atheism. As we move on from Genesis 1, everything we learn, embrace, and submit to is predicated on the fact that an omnipotent, that is all-powerful and sovereign God, created us and everything that is around us. And I'm talking about set the stars in place, set the moon in place, and said, do what I tell you until I tell you different. He set that sun in place and the earth revolving around that sun and the moon revolving around the earth. He set them in place and he told them, do what I told you to do until I tell you different. Amen. And it's so accurate and it's through the ages. It hasn't veered or varied at all. He alone is the creator. Yet it starts, it says, with that profound statement that God is sovereign and He created everything around us. It all starts with that profound statement of Genesis 1 in the first two verses which we just read. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. When there was nothing else, God was there. Then when He began to create, He was not a passive observer who simply set things in motion. He was entirely involved in the act and the process of creation. Yet do you realize that the Bible nowhere attempts to prove the existence of God? And I hadn't really ever thought about that until I read this commentary. Have you ever thought that the Bible nowhere attempts to prove the existence of God? It just says, in the beginning was God states that fact. This reality is simply accepted as fact from the beginning. In the beginning, God. 
However, the Bible also presents a humanity predisposed to belief in some form of deity or even multiple gods. And this is why really this atheism is a new concept. Because human nature itself draws us to believe in a supreme being or unfortunately some of the pagan beliefs that made the mistake of being of many beings or did many actual well they called them gods they called them gods uh, Psalms 95 and I, I've got some of these scriptures here Psalms 96 and 5 says for all the gods of nations are idols but the Lord made the heavens Amen. Jeremiah 10 and 11 says thus shall ye say unto them the gods that have not made the heavens that have not made the heavens and the earth even they perish from the earth and from under these heavens yeah. Romans chapter 1 verses 20 through 32 says for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that the, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Folks, is, this, is it happening? Is it happening? Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Why do you think there's a, just an explosion of this type of, of uh, I guess, I'd call it foolishness today? And there is. And this is why. Because they refused to retain God in their knowledge. Amen. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's why all these things are being invented. And it just keeps getting crazier and crazier as it goes. Every time I watch the news, I see them talking about some other concept that they've came up with and some other woke-ism or something. Yeah. And, and it's totally ludicrous and it goes totally against the Word of God. Amen. And there's a reason for it. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. So many people today support, I think they actually, and folks we wonder, you know, they're the product of our public schools. We wonder why in the world that a lot of these things are taking place. They polled our young people, and I'm talking about teenagers in, in high school and in college, and asked them about same-sex marriage. Did you know that 70% of them were for it? 70% of them, even a huge percentage of that were children that were raised in church and that were attending church. Why? Because we haven't taught them the truth. We haven't taught them the truth. And folks, the fact is, we're teaching them less and less. I can remember when the Sunday school used to be full. I can remember when mamas would get up and fix their clothes and lay their clothes out for their children and they would take them to Sunday school and today very few of the young people see the need and all of the children's church 
leaders will tell you what we do is a different thing what we do is a different ministry you as as even in your working with children will tell you that yes the kids crusades are great and they learn a lot during that time but they need that Sunday school atmosphere weekly and they need to be taught on a regular basis the Word of God because even the children church leaders will tell you well what we do we have church it's different from this Sunday school that we used to have and folks whatever tools that were used I remember the little flannel boards where the Sunday school teachers would put them up yes and you would learn those Bible stories and you learned God's precepts from them and sadly today very few are bringing their kids to Sunday school and the thing about it is most churches if they that they're attended most churches don't even have it anymore all right I'm gonna get off my soapbox Psalms Psalms 10 and 4 says the wicked through pride of his countenance will not seek after God God is not in all his thoughts Psalms 14 and 1 the fool hath said in his heart there is no God they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none that doeth good Isaiah 44 and 6 says thus saith the Lord the King of Israel and his Redeemer the Lord of hosts I am the first I am the last and beside me there is no God these people were believing in multiple gods these pagan beliefs and religions that we're talking about here but all of these things the Bible presents only the wicked and fools having the audacity to declare that there is no God yet we also encounter the prophet Isaiah who gave us the Lord's response to pagan idolatry by saying there is no other God the Apostle Paul echoed these words when addressing the idolatrous Corinthians and folks this is rampant I can tell you people that I know of that I've came that I come into contact with regularly and people some of them that I am even kin to have allowed some of these people into their homes and they've studied with them and I've been talking to them and I've even said went so far as to say before you seem to be sounding like you don't think that Jesus is God and they'll make such statements as I don't have to scripture plainly declares that he's not God it doesn't but yet they've been deceived they've been deceived and a lot of people uh, you know a lot of them will teach well you know you have God capital G and you have all and Jesus is with a little G you know folks if you have never heard this one it's it's going around and the same ones will tell you there's no hell that hell doesn't exist yes they will and sadly they will find out but folks that's why it is so important that we do these studies that we're doing today the Christian believer knows that there is only one God that there is only one God as a matter of fact first Corinthians 8 verse 4 says as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered to sac in sacrifice unto idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one you know this question that I that I ask them when they start that well Jesus is God with a little g and, you know Jehovah's a God with a big g I said wait a minute I believe I read well back there somewhere toward the beginning of the book where it says that I the Lord God am one there was no God formed before me and there will be no God formed after me so if Jesus is not God then what or who is he we're going to have to study the word to find out the one true God is the creator but for us there is one God one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were created and through whom we live creation bears witness to the undeniable fact of God's of God's existence questions when was your earliest memory of being aware of God when was your earliest memory of being aware of God pardon me nighttime prayers and you were taught to do that weren't you as a child that's why that's why it's so important we teach your kids these things and that we teach them because I'm gonna tell you and you better be guiding them while you're teaching them too because you know in their heart they can feel 
they can feel and they can know the presence of God. Uh, I'll never forget one time my little cousin, my uncle was telling me about my little cousin sitting in the floor of the living room and he had the television on and Jimmy Swaggart was preaching. And when he came on, his son looked up at the TV and he said, God. Well, he had to explain to him, no son, that is not God. But that's a preacher of the word. I mean, some way or another in his little mind, he knew who that he was talking about. And that's why we have to guide them and we have to nurture them and bring them up in the ways of God. God is distinct from creation. Let's go to Psalms 96. Psalms 96, and we're going to read verse 5. It says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Now our view of God greatly impacts our worship of Him. There's a tendency to make our view of Him too small. We may see Him as our judge, our provider, or our friend, but He is so much more. He is more than we can comprehend. And we must be cautious not to limit our view of Him to the attributes that we can grasp with our finite minds. Our one and only Creator God must never be confused with or seen as part of His creation. He is set apart and above His creation. We must then be aware of a false teaching called pantheism, which identifies God as the sum total of all that exists in the universe. Another false teaching is animism which makes God equivalent to all animate life in creation. But the Bible never equates the world nor anything in it as a part of God, not even the spiritual or the non-material realities. Instead, the psalmist declares the gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The term idols points to something that is worthless or good for nothing. These objects did not create the heavens and the earth, but idols instead will someday vanish from the earth. Jeremiah 10 and 11, as a matter of fact, says that. I think I've got that one here. And maybe not. But these all, you know, our, our one and only creator... The terms idols points to something that is worthless, Amen. that's totally useless, that has no good use. It's good for nothing. These objects did not create the heavens and the earth, and they will vanish from the earth, according to the prophet Jeremiah. By contrast, the one true God created all that exists by His power, preserves it by His wisdom, and exercises sovereign control over all creation. Verse 13, and I, I, I went down too far. I, re, I really need to go over and read Jeremiah. Let's go over and read that. Jeremiah 10. Yeah. Read verse 11 and 12. It says, Thus shall you say unto them that the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Nothing about creation, folks, is by chance. Nothing about creation is by chance or happenstance or confusion nothing. When God set it in order, He set it in order. Nothing. And therefore, knowing that fact, verse 12, He hath made the earth by His power, He hath established the world by His wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion. <coughs> Evolution is absurd. That's right. Totally absurd. <laughs> it is. I mean, how, what much more could you get? How much closer to, to confusion and happenstance and chance 
than that theory of evolution. It's absurd. 250 genders is ludicrous. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it is. And yet it just gets worse and worse. Amen. When you think they've reached is the, the height of ignorance and stupidity, they come out with something else. How in the world? I mean, I don't. I just, I can't see. The term idols, it points to something that is worthless or good for nothing. And exercises, you know, we're talking about, by contrast, the one true God created all that exists by his power, preserves it by his wisdom, and exercises sovereign control over all creation. God stands distinct from creation and is the sovereign Lord over all. Matter of fact, says, see Acts 7 and 47 through 50. Acts 7 and 47 through 50 says, But Solomon built an house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Acts 17, verses 24 through 26. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord in heaven, of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation what does fallen humanity do naturally in response to the revelation that is seen in creation what does fallen humanity do naturally in response to the revelation that is seen in creation we're going to, let's turn over to Romans 1 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not. And folks, I'm not going to read the whole thing again, but they knew they were without excuse. And the reason that they are without excuse, you know, humanity is religious by nature. I mean, this is proven by before the word of God came to the people of Canaan and the, all of these pagans and things, they were worshiping gods of their own creation. Yeah. You know, this, this atheism thing is, is kind of a thing that just came along not too awfully long ago. Humanity is religious by nature, so why do you think people worship gods of their own making? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Even people who read the word of God and don't take the full counsel of God and maybe even just pick scriptures here and there, they worship a God of their own making. That's right. So many times I see some of these preachers and one of these religions, and I'm talking about beliefs, I guess, that are really, really coming to the forefront in these days, this prosperity doctrine that we have. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If it won't work in poorest Africa, then it won't work here. You know, I'm talking about those preachers that will kind of get on to you, and if you don't have enough money and you're not rich, then well, you don't have faith that you should have. I'm going to tell you something. What did Paul say? Paul said, whatsoever state I'm in, I found therefore therewith to be happy. To be happy. All of us are not rich. You know, some of us, I'll never forget, uh, Brother Barron telling about the story about the man who actually 
started was saved and started church and paying his tithes and he made about a hundred dollars a week you know and it's pretty easy to figure his tithes were ten dollars a week he didn't have any problem paying his tithes well he got a new job and he got a raise and he started making several thousand dollars a week and he, he started having trouble paying that much he came down he told the pastor he said listen he said pray for me he said i'm having trouble making paying my tithes he said uh, back when i only made a hundred dollars a week it was pretty easy to pay my tithes and now that i'm making so much it seems hard and so the pastor said well all right let's come down here to the altar and we'll pray and he knelt down there with him he started praying he said lord he said take this new job away from brother so and so and give him his old job back to where he said wait 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 he said don't be praying that <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you something. Think about that. That's right. You know, just just bless God and thank God that you are have a good enough job that you can that you can pay more in tithes yeah. rather than less. Don't you know? How many times have have we heard and we realized that the love of the money, love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, all evil. Yet it happens so many times. People start worshiping gods of their own making. If they don't just change God into something that really doesn't exist except in their own mind, and they'll worship Him. And if they're not worshiping God, they're going to be worshiping something else. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. A lot of people have made money an idol in this day and time. And folks, not only did He create it, but He created it with order and design. Let's go back to Genesis 1. We're going to begin reading this time in verse 3 and read down through verse 19. And God said, there it is. Now pay attention how many times when we're studying this, how many times this does say this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. A uh, literal 24-hour days. Uh, that's another one that's going around. That's another one going around. They'll, they'll, they'll be talking about, well, these were not literal 24-hour days. You know, the reason God was able to create all these things was because that these were symbolically called days and blah, blah, blah. The Word of God says the evening right. and the morning Amen. were the second day. I know we would think about it today maybe as the morning and the evening were the first day. You know when the Jewish day begins. The Hebrew day begins at dark, at sunset. That's when the day begins. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, there it is again, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven and divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God said and it was so and God said and it was so how did it come about and God made two great lights and the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also 
And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God said, God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now God's incredible planning in creation reflects his love for humanity and it reveals his power. As we observe what God has made with, within and around us, we see that he is the powerful and sovereign God and thereby worthy of our worship. The creation account in Genesis 1, 3 through 19, which we just read, reveals that creation itself was intricately ordered and designed by God. The days of creation were not arbitrary or incidental, but a carefully planned progression that allowed for interdependent systems, biological, geological, ecological, etc., yeah. to take shape, supporting all the elements existing within creation, both animate and inanimate, plant and animal. And you know what? I'm a, I want to read verse 11 again. Let's go back to verse 11. Because it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Sorry, Mr. Darwin. You're wrong. You're wrong. It didn't just come about by evolution and things changing in from one thing to another. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. All of the modern origin of species is wrong. Mr. Darwin, you cultivated a huge lie upon, create, upon the, the whole world, as a matter of that fact, because it's taught everywhere. It's taught in our schools. The creation account in Genesis 1, 3 through 19 reveals that creation itself was intricately and ordered and designed by God. Looking at verses 3 through 19, we say that, see that God began creation with the basics of earth itself, including the division of day and night. And you know, God named earth. He named this planet and this place that he created for man to exist, that he was going to that he was going to create man and give them a perfect place to live. He then separated the land from the water and created vegetation to grow on the ground. Next, he placed the sun and the moon in the sky. All of this was in preparation for the remainder of his creation. Both animals and human beings would need what he created during these first four days. How does the complexity and the order and the design that we observe in the world and the universe not only confirm the existence of God, but also tells us what God is like? He wanted to make sure that we had everything we needed, didn't he? Because he loved us and he wants what's good for us. Order and design reveal God's glory. Reveals God's glory. We're going. Let's take it back up at verse 20. Genesis 1 beginning in verse 20. We're going to read down through verse 25. Beginning in verse 20 says, And God said, there it is again, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that they fl may fly above the earth, and the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Yeah and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed him, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth... There's a, and God said... How many times? I wonder. We're going to have to count those one of these days. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast, of the earth after his kind and it was so and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw that it was good after his kind some ten times is how many times it says that in this count of creation 
the thing about it is, and one of the major hurdles that this theory of evolution, evolution has never been able to get over is, how many of you ever seen a half dog, half cat running up down the streets? <laughs> they don't exist. They reproduce after their own right. kind. Amen. I mean, how many times have you ever been fishing and catch a fish that was half mammal? had hair maybe a fish that had hair you know and he was in the middle of changing over to be I'll tell you what I'd throw it back pretty quick think about these things folks because and you if when you do you'll get to thinking about how silly these theories and these things that people come up with on their own Not only does God order and design creation and speak the power of God, it also declares His glory and His worthiness of our worship. An all-powerful God who created such a beautiful and orderly universe deserves to be glorified by humanity. His crowning achievement, created in His image, after preparing the earth with light and darkness, and after land and plant life and the sun and the moon, God then created creatures to live on the earth in the water and in the air and after this passage he created the highest order human beings they were created in his image and would be a reflection of his glory the psalmist invited his readers to look at the heavens and the work of God's fingers and marveled at how God stoops down to care for humanity and creation and the handiwork of God we can observe the heavens proclaim the glory of God and the skies display his craftsmanship Everything that God made culminating in humanity reveals His power and His splendor and His glory. What parts of God's creation most powerfully declare His glory to you? Why? I'll tell you what, nature, just the beauty of nature, declares His glory to me. Does space exploration and other scientific studies increase your belief in God as creator? Yes, they do, because every time that they discover something new and how intricate that these things and these systems that God set in place, all it does is build my faith. Amen. That's all it does. Let's read verses 26 through 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Humanity is certainly unique in creation in that God has created us in His own, it created us in His own image and furthermore, He has placed upon us the responsibility to reign over creation. Genesis 1 helps us to better understand the meaning and the significance of these two important realities. In Genesis, we read that humankind is unique among God's creation because of this distinction. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and all the small animals that scurry along on the ground. Thus, humanity shares the dominion over God's creation. Forever, since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything that God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. This is what theologians call general revelation, the universal witness of creation available to be seen by all humanity. But Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27 also informs us of the nature of humanity as holding the highest position in all that God created. This speaks to our, our role of stewardship in reigning over creation. Verse 28 states that humanity is to subdue or govern. 
creation. Ruling over creation might be described as a responsibility to promote and protect the well-being of the rest of nature. To say that humanity is made in God's image points to humans being rational and morally responsible. This concept, concept can also point to our spiritual relationship with God before humanity fell into sin and the relationship was fractured. The terms translated image and likeness are similar to the Hebrew language. It says image makes reference to a close copy of something and likeness is a, is a word of comparison. In short, human beings are uniquely like God but are not identical identical excuse me identical if I can talk this morning and certainly they are not God and I want to add a little phrase to that and never will be God's this is another this is another that I've heard uh, false you know that that we will one day be little gods that we're you know and folks this is taught and not just in uh, Mormonism or wherever they, they're kind of well known for that but there are others I mean I've heard some real popular Bible teachers that believe that fall for this and believe that that you know that we'll be we'll be like God we'll be little gods no we won't we were created in his image but we're not ever going to evolve into a God ain't happening ain't happening matter of fact God created us a little bit different and uh, you know, and I want to go back to verse 27 because in this day and time, I think it bears repeating. It says, "So God created man in His own image; in the image of God created him, male and female. Created He them. There's two genders, folks, Amen. not 250. No There's two genders. No confusion. That's right. That's right. I know it was just a little funny thing. My grandma said that her dad." which would be my great-grandpa used to always say that, you know, talking about molecules and talking about things that are created and even the things that we can't see, we know they're there because we can feel it. When we fan ourselves, we can feel that, you know. And uh, one of the things that he used to always say, it was just kind of a funny thing. He always said, if you'd suck a sow, you could see the wind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true, and I'll never find out. <laughs> I promise you. But, folks, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of things that people talk about and a lot of things that they'll tell you are true today that makes about as much sense as that statement. Yeah. And if you, if you don't pay attention and you, you veer from this word, you're going to end up as confused as they are. So folks, it's very important. These things that we're studying this morning and that we're learning this morning are very important. Amen. And even so much more so to our children. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't teach them this, them folks are going to teach them that. Because that's what they want them to believe. Amen. And it is getting so much further and further from God's plan and the way that He had it planned. I heard the bell. We're out of time. We almost made it through it.